So what about the risks and complications? Now, I know this is not a very pleasant topic, but it's an important one. Remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and that's why you select me. Safety first. Now, if for some reason you're not a candidate for LASIK, I will direct you toward another procedure, such as the EVO implantable contact lens, PRK, or clear lens extraction, refractive lens exchange. Or we simply won't do any type of surgery at all. If it's not safe and maximally effective, we're not going to do it. Safety first. Well, what about the need for glasses after your surgery? This is very rare. The vast majority of people never need glasses or contact lenses following LASIK. But if you do, and I don't know who will and who won't, so everyone must plan for the possibility of needing glasses following your laser procedure, especially for night driving, and especially if you have monovision. For those people over 40 years old who do not elect to have monovision, reading and computer glasses will be mandatory. Now, a certain percentage of patients experience glare and halos around point sources of light, such as headlights or street lights or overhead lights, and starbursts coming off oncoming headlights or overhead lights, or decrease in what we call contrast sensitivity or contrast appreciation, which is the ability to discern subtle shades of gray. Actually, everyone will experience these symptoms up to a year following LASIK, but only a very small percentage will experience these symptoms permanently following your laser procedure. For the most part, for patients in whom these symptoms remain, they're a mild annoyance. They're not profoundly disturbing. But an ultra-small percentage of patients are devastated by the presence of glare and halos around point sources of light or starburst off of point sources of light, and a significant decrease in contrast sensitivity, such that you can't drive at night or function well in a dimly lit environment, such as a conference room or a classroom, where you need to look at a blackboard or a whiteboard or a screen in a dark or dimly lit room. Again, this is very rare, and I'm happy to say that in my practice, I do not have any patients who are devastated by these symptoms especially since we do all laser LASIK with the femtosecond flap and the wavefront shaping. And this is, again, partly because we are very conservative in whom we select for laser vision surgery to begin with. Now, about 3 to 4 percent of people, depending upon your degree of nearsightedness or farsightedness or astigmatism, will either be undercorrected or overcorrected or have residual or induced astigmatism where no astigmatism existed before. In almost all cases, the degree of undercorrection or overcorrection or astigmatism is very mild and most people are not bothered by it. But if it's significant, then you'll need to wear temporary glasses for a few months until your measurements are stable and then we can do an enhancement. Typically, we do the enhancement at about three to four months following the initial procedure. We go back to the laser center, we lift the existing flap, apply the laser for only a few seconds, lay the flap back down, and then you go home and rest for the night as you did following your initial procedure. Then we examine you the next day, and you're back to work the following day. And generally, of course, a second enhancement is not required. So let's discuss the dry eye in greater detail. A post-LASIK dry eye is more common in a perimenopausal woman, especially far-sighted perimenopausal women. LASIK in and of itself can precipitate a dry eye, and it can certainly exacerbate an underlying dry eye. So we're very diligent in checking for evidence of a preoperative dry eye at your preoperative examination. Now sometimes, although disappointing, we have to postpone the surgery in order to treat the dry eye before we consider doing LASIK. Rarely, we have to treat the dry eye for months, sometimes even six to eight months if there's a significant underlying dry eye. So, if I have to cancel an already scheduled surgery because of the dry eye, I know it's disappointing and I'm sorry, but remember, safety first. Can you imagine walking onto an airplane and the captain gets on the PA system and says, sorry ladies and gentlemen, we're having mechanical difficulties. You're not gonna stand up and say, ah, take off anyway. So the thing is, if we can't do your surgery because it's not safe, then we're going to do everything we can as a team to make sure it is safe 
and then we will proceed with your surgery. So the treatment of your dry eye before surgery will consist of the diligent and frequent application of non-preserved artificial tears, as well as oral dietary supplements such as fish oil and other omega-3 supplements. And also, we will plug the lower tear drains in order to allow your eye to more effectively retain the natural tears that your own eye makes, as well as the artificial tears that you're using. Additionally, we may have you use topical anti-inflammatory preparations such as Restasis or Zydra or Sequa and or a topical cortisone preparation. We may even possibly have you use an oral antibiotic such as doxycycline for a couple of months. Together, you and I as a team will work hard to make sure that your dry eye gets better and then we can safely proceed with your LASIK. Now, even if we achieve a perfectly non-dry surface, a small percentage of patients will develop a post-operative dry eye. Or conversely, let's say you don't start with a dry eye at all, but after LASIK, a small percentage of patients will develop a bothersome dry eye, even if no dry eye existed before. Now, a dry eye after LASIK is quite a nuisance in that the vision isn't as good as it could be and the eye is uncomfortable and it's much harder to treat a dry eye after LASIK than to treat the dry eye before LASIK. Now, sometimes it can take a few years to resolve the signs and symptoms of the post-LASIK dry eye. That's why we're so fastidious in treating the dry eye prior to LASIK. So let's review flap problems. Now, flap problems can occur either during the surgery or after the surgery, potentially many years after the procedure. During the procedure, the flap can either be cut too thin, or when you cut the flap, it can have little buttonholes, almost like Swiss cheese, because as the femtosecond laser courses across the cornea, in exceptionally rare instances, it can create a small hole in the flap, or sometimes the suction ring, which is attaches the femtosecond laser to the surface of the cornea, dislodges from the surface of the cornea, and we don't get a complete flap. In those instances, we don't lift the flap on the day of surgery, but wait a period of time and return to the laser suite and create another flap, which is deeper than the first flap, and then successfully perform the laser procedure. These occurrences are exceptionally rare, and I'm happy to say that in the very few cases that I've had, we've been able to successfully create a new flap and achieve the patient's visual goals. Now, what about disasters with the flap? These are very rare, and in over 70,000 LASIK procedures, I'm happy to say that I have not had a single case of a flap disaster. However, they can occur, and it's important that you are aware of this potential. A disaster would be if the laser cuts the flap and severely harms the flap, or cuts the flap such that the flap is lost and we can't find it. Although I've never seen this, it's possible. However, in that case, the patient may be obligated to have a PRK, or if not deemed safe, may be obligated to wear a soft contact or even a hard contact or a scleral lens in order to achieve their very best vision. Or, may have to undergo a corneal transplant operation in order to restore a more natural curvature of the cornea using a donor cornea. What about post-operative flap problems? Well, those generally occur within the first 24 to 48 hours, or they can actually occur late and may present many years after surgery as a result of physical trauma to the eye. The early post-operative flap problems generally consist of slipping of the flap. If the flap slips, then we go back to the laser center and we reposition the flap, place a soft contact lens on the eye for a few days, and those eyes do great. By the way, this happens very rarely, but I have encountered a number of these cases, and we've always been able to be successful in repositioning the flap, and within a week or two, the vision is just as good as it is in the other eye. Many years down the road, it's possible, but again, extremely unlikely that a direct blow to the eye could result in displacing the flap, requiring repositioning of the flap. In an exceptionally small percentage of patients, the flap can be physically torn off the eye many years after the procedure, such that the patient, again, would be obligated to wear a contact lens or undergo a corneal transplant operation. Another post-operative flap complication would be the induction of microfolds in the flap. 
This is seen very rarely in the very nearsighted patient, usually above minus seven or minus eight. These microfolds are like the folds that we see when we tear off cellophane off the roll. They're very fine microstria in the flap. Now, most of the time when we see the microfolds, they're asymptomatic in that patients have no decrease in visual acuity or decrease in visual quality. But in a small percentage of patients, there can be a permanent decrease in vision or contrast sensitivity or an increase in the possibility of glare and halo or starburst. If you have microfolds and they're causing symptoms, we can go back to the laser suite and attempt to iron out these microfolds by lifting the flap. But there's no perfect treatment for microfolds, and in most cases, the microfolds don't get much better. Even in the presence of microfolds, patients are left with much improved vision, but not vision that may be up to their goal. And patients may need to occasionally wear glasses, particularly for night driving, or if the vision is just not what they expect, even with glasses, in those rare cases, it, they may be obligated to wear soft contact lenses or even a hard contact lens to achieve the best possible vision. In the tens of thousands of highly nearsighted people in whom I've performed LASIK, I do have a few patients with symptomatic microfolds, but I have to say I don't have anybody where the microfolds are severe enough that glasses full-time or contact lenses are required. But it's possible, so you need to know about it, especially if you're highly nearsighted.